let me tell you about Welsh Celtic fairy rings. If you are interested in fairies, then you've probably already heard of fairy rings. In popular media, fairy rings are usually depicted as rings of toadstools or mushrooms. But in Wales, fairy rings were usually depicted as just rings of discoloured grass. Fairy rings would usually be found under oak trees, the sacred tree of the Welsh fairy. The fairies would usually dance around the fairy rings under the oak trees. <laughs> the fairy rings acted as portals, but not into the realm of fairy per se. They were basically portals into little pocket dimensions where the fairies danced and time didn't seem to exist. Follow for more. Yes, so the Morrigan is my favorite goddess. She is a goddess of war and fate, and the Morrigan can roughly translate to Phantom Queen, Goddess of Phantoms, the Great Queen. She's a trinity goddess, so she's composed of three sisters, one of whom is the Battle Crow, which is why she's later associated with like banshees. The second is a sovereignty goddess, so like ownership of land, she's the personification of land. And the third sister is kind of a personification of the frenzy of war, the nature of like battle. She's sometimes connected with Morgan Le Fay from Arthurian legends, and she's most famous in Celtic mythology for the Ulster cycle and the mythological cycle. But the bad news, because she's a goddess of fate, is that if you saw her in her maiden form and she was washing bloody rags in the river, it was actually foretelling your doom as a warrior. She was often thought to be the one inciting the violence. Wanna see something really cool and magical? So as opposed to most other witches, I don't actually use crystals much in my practice. I only own a few crystals, like a handful, and most of them either came from secondhand shops or they're things I literally found myself. But that doesn't mean I'm not still a bit of a magpie and attracted to anything shiny. Now, when I was around 15, 16, I was already practicing witchcraft and I was obsessed, and I mean obsessed, with any kind of sea creatures or water creatures, especially Kelpies. I loved Kelpies so much that I even changed my middle name on Facebook to Kelpie. Anyway, I also grew up on the coast. I grew up on the coast of Aberfrau and Ismod, North Wales. And I once put out a kind of like call to the creatures of the waters and the wild, <laughs> like being a bit dramatic. And then I found this on the beach and it is a piece of sea glass with a horse on it. I literally found a sea glass water horse and isn't it beautiful? Actually, Scotland's version of the Banshee, the Ben Nye, is so much creepier. Ah! She doesn't scream, and she does vary from the Banshee in a, quite a few different ways. So although she is a feminine messenger of death in the same way that the Banshee is, she doesn't seem to haunt outside people's homes. Instead, you can find her by streams and rivers, crouched over the water, washing blood-ridden clothes. These clothes are said to belong to the person that is about to die. If you see a Ben Nye out on your travels, you, you cannot leave her alone. You can't look at her and walk away. So if you know that she's around, just don't look at her. If you do look at her, you have to approach her from behind when she's not looking, because she's said to have long breasts that she flips over her shoulder. In order to protect yourself, you're supposed to suckle on one of the breasts. And if the blood-ridden clothes were yours, you can spare your fate. <laughs> a guide to Welsh fairies, Cobble and I. Wales is a nation that is steeped in a culture of mining. But did you know, we also have our own version of mining fairies. Cobble and I are pygmy dwarf-like creatures who live in the mines of Wales. <gasps> They knock, knock, knock underground with their phantom pickaxes and shovels, and according to miners, they're actually seen as good fortune. Yes, that's right. The Cobble and I are essentially benevolent creatures who live in the mines, and they are usually a good omen for anyone doing any mining. Though they are mining creatures, they seem to have very little interest in crystals, minerals, or ores, as they usually lead humans to good minerals, crystals, and ores. They are sometimes invisible, almost always benevolent, unless you treat them badly. Follow for more fairy lore. Folklore in 60 seconds, you've heard of changeling children. Well, what about the other way round? 
poor Cornish couple were said to be foraging and once they pulled back the gorse bush, what did they see? But a sleeping pisky child. Now what they should have done is left the sleeping fellow well alone, but they took him home instead, thinking that one day they might be able to get a crock of gold. Now, although a foolish couple, they weren't unkind. They treated him lovely and he always played with their children and happily accepted his fate except for one day. The couple went out to forage for food again, leaving the children alone. And from inside the farmhouse, what do they hear but Skilly Widden, Skilly Widden, where is my little child? The fellow peeked out the door frame and saw his family and ran to them happy as could be. They would surely have been punished were it not for their kindness. I hope you all had an absolutely wonderful Imolk. Yesterday, the 1st of February, and today, Many pagans across the world celebrated Imolk, as well as Candlemas and other festivals of spring. In the Welsh traditions, Imolk can be referred to as either Gwyl a Canwichai, or in my native Anglesey, Gwyl Braint. Braint is the Welsh equivalent of Bridget or Brid, and she is the goddess of spring and healing. Upon Gwyl Braint, or Gwyl a Canwichai, we light candles and place them in the window, and we honour the goddess of spring and healing. How did you celebrate Imbolc or Gwyl Bryant or Gwyl Canwichai Candlemas? Let me know in the comments below. Did you know that Wales has its own collection and body of mythology? The Mabinogi, or as it is usually published under the Mabinogion, is the Welsh collection of myths and legends. Wow. Or at the very least, the majority of them. The Mabinogi is split into four branches. The word Mab in Mabinogi actually means sun in Wales, and many of the tales in here revolve around sons and mothers. Many of the characters that feature in the Mabinogi are probably very familiar to you, such as Trianon, Branwen, Hir, all those lovely people. The Mabinogi was first translated into English in its entirety by Lady Charlotte Guest in the 19th century, and the word Mabinogion is often considered these days as a mistranslation. They tried to pluralize the word Mabinogi, but Mabinogi is a plural in and of itself. I'm on a roll and my phone is gonna die, so I have to replace it soon. This is another fae. This is the Deragdu. Now, you might be more familiar with this one. This is the fae that inspired much of modern vampire lore. She was originally human. Now, this does not happen often that a human becomes a fae. And she was in love with a young man. And she was forced into an arranged marriage where she was sexually and physically abused until the day she died by starvation. At her funeral... She jumped up and drained the life out of her ex-husband, and then she haunts the Moors. So much of vampiric lore, including what Bram Stoker put on the image of Vlad the Impaler, was inspired by her. Not being able to cross water, the iron, how they die, was inspired by this very, very, very tragic fae. Let me tell you about the Kuhn Anuvan, the hounds of the other world. I've already made a video all about Anuvan, the Welsh, Celtic, Otherworld or Underworld, but have you heard of the dogs of Anuvan? The Kuhn Anuvan are first featured in the Mabinogi, the collection of Welsh myths, and they're described as white dogs with blood red ears. In the Mabinogi, the Kuhn Anuvan are the hounds of the other world, belonging to the kings of the other world. Your simple otherworldly hunting hounds. Who's a good boy? In folkloric tradition, the Kudanovan transformed to become spectral hounds who ravage the night sky as part of the wild hunt. That wild hunt led by none other than King of Fairy and God of Liminality, Gwyn and Pnir. I think the Kudanovan would make beautiful pets. Puppies. After all, otherworldly hounds are man's best friend. In Breton mythology, the Bugle Noz is a very sad, solitary and lonely creature. 
He walks alone in the forest and screams when he's walking through so that animals and people know that he's about to arrive. He does this out of a kindness because he's said to be so ugly and monstrous looking that he would terrify anyone that beheld him. So to save them from that fate, he lets them know when it's time for them to rush home and get home safe. He is the last of his kind and is really kind of seen as a protector of people and of the forest. But he's so sad and lonely and just crying all the time because he's so ugly. Just want to give him a hug. He's lovely. But obviously this is the type of myth that gets people um, safe when it's dark outside back home. In Welsh Celtic mythology, water is seen as highly sacred, but why? Well, it's all to do with the Welsh Celtic Otherworld, you see. The realm of fairy, realm of the dead, Anovan, Anun. What does it have to do with that, though? You see, as opposed to most other cultures, Otherworld or Underworld, the Welsh Celtic Otherworld was completely accessible from the realm of mortals. You see, mortals could easily slip into the realm of Anovan via water, via deep caves, or via other means, such as walking into a dark forest in Carmarthen. So if you see a deep lake or a deep puddle, it might be a portal to the realm of fairy. See you later. I'm going in. Where'd she go now? Hi guys, I don't know if you know this, but in folklore, corgis are actually fairy dogs. So fairies essentially ride corgis into battle. So I don't really know what that says about the queen. Uh, I'm not saying that she is a fairy, but I'm also not going to say that she's not a fairy. Or the dark alternative is that she's destroyed all of the fairies and collected their battle steeds. Wales probably has one of the best flags in the world, but do you know how the Red Dragon became the emblem of Wales? It all started a long time ago when King Vortig and a Celtic king wanted to build a castle. He decided to build the castle in Erurri in North Wales, Snowdonia. However, mysteriously, every night the castle fell down. No matter how many times they tried rebuilding the castle, it always fell to shreds. King Vortigan was infuriated by this and called upon his wise men for counsel. His so-called wise men told him that the only way he could fix this problem was by slaughtering a young boy. However, when they brought a young boy to be slaughtered, the young boy said, actually, it's because there's two dragons fighting under the castle. They checked, and there were two dragons. One red dragon, one white dragon, representing whales and invaders. That boy turned out to be Merlin. When most people think about fairies, they usually think of little Tinkerbell-style creatures. But the fairies of Celtic fairy lore are usually very different. Take Welsh fairy lore, for example. I'm Welsh. <laughs> we have this one type of fairy called a Gwychion. The Gwychion are a subspecies of mountain fairy, and honestly, they're terrifying. The Gwychion are usually depicted as hag-like fairies who stalk the pathways of the mountainous regions of Wales, such as Arari. They would usually appear before travellers as they were wandering the mountains. Legend says that if you come into contact with the Gwychion, you are certain to lose your way. It was advised that all travellers in the mountainous regions take knives with them, as taking a knife out of the pocket made the Gwychion vanish. So basically, if you're walking in the mountains of Wales and you see a hag-like creature skipping along beside you, run. Folklore in 60 seconds. Here is an excellent example of folklore that has travelled across the world. So, the knockers in Cornish folklore are gnome-like creatures that live inside mines and they knock on the side of mine shafts when the mine is about to collapse. Now, miners are supposed to celebrate and look after knockers. So when you're eating your Cornish pasty, you're supposed to leave the last bit or the crust left over for the knockers. So there's a nice mutual relationship there.
Now this is really similar to the Welsh cobbler now, who serve exactly the same function. They live inside the mines and they sort of look after the miners working there, but there has to be that sort of relationship. They can be mischievous, but mostly they're not dangerous. So when Cornish and Welsh miners travelled to America, they brought their folklore with them, which brings us to Tommy Knockers in American folklore. They wear mining garb and usually carry little pickaxes and carried little lanterns.